My dear respected brothers and elders, one of the things Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he came to promote amongst us was ukhuwa and brotherhood. It's really essential that we do away with our sort of ideological differences that are we can that we can do away with and definitely things of culture have no importance within Islam. Because you're from Bangladesh, someone from Pakistan, someone from Syria, someone from Morocco, Algeria, Somalia, Tunisia. If you say La ilaha illallah, that makes you a Muslim brother. And then for you and that brother, you're, you have the same concerns. You, have the, you look out for one another. The, the, the difficulty which befalls you also befalls them. Ahwal that befall you also befall them. And as a result, what happens is as Muslims, we're supposed to look out for one another. Muslims are supposed to look out for everyone in humanity. But the Prophet ﷺ mentions Al-Muslim Akhul Muslim That any Muslim, whoever he is, wherever he may be He is the brother of another Muslim So for us, Alhamdulillah, we're Muslim brothers Now one of the things which we find which is common Especially in the past few recent years A big influx of people from certain countries And a lot of people that have arrived from off other shores and as a result, what's happened is there's been a big spike and an increase in specifically those children that have gone into foster care or gone into social care. Okay, in 2015, 3,000 plus Muslims, more than 3,000, they were in social care. Okay, more than, do you understand what we mean by social care? Meaning they're, they're taken away from their parents and they're put with foster carers or social work, uh, other parents to look after them. In 2000, and, uh, after that, I beg your pardon, over 4,000, 4,000. So you see, it's, it's actually increasing and gone higher. In 2018, right, 4,250 unaccompanied refugee children living in care, mainly from Muslim countries. 4,250 children. That means countries like Sudan, Eritrea, Albania, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Syria, and the likes. Okay, so these children who are our children, they're not, it, it doesn't mean because he's a Bengali, I'll say he's a Bengali kid, or a Syrian kid, or a Syrian kid, Maghribi kid, Jazairi kid, no, no, not a Muslim. When we look at that child, we say, Alhamdulillah, he's my child, he's our child, he's our responsibility, this is our community's responsibility. That child is ours, that, that daughter is ours. When we see a fellow Muslim brother, and wallahi, this makes me wallah so upset, khudaki qasam. When I see a fellow Muslim brother, even if I don't know who they are, like if I know they're Muslim, Allah is my witness, I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I don't start going there and gripping man up, but this much I will do, I'll say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is the haqq of another Muslim. And Rasulullah SAW mentioned, Inna min ashrati sa'a an yusallim al rajul ala rajul, la yusallim alayhi illa li ma'rifah. A time will come, the sign of qiyamah will come, a Muslim will only greet another Muslim because he knows him. Because he knows him, that's why he'll give salam. If I, see a Muslim, if I see a sister wearing hijab on the street, I know there's an issue of, of I'm not going to start going there and start talking anything faldu, but when I walk past her, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Khalas. That enough just to let her know that you're my sister. When I see a brother and I can recognize him as being, being a brother, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You see, regardless if you tie your hands here or here, I mean loudly, quietly, by Allah, these are small issues. The bigger issue is that these are all ikhwa, these are all brothers, these are all part of the Muslim Ummah. Those same children that have gone into care, 4,250 in 2018, just last year, they're our responsibility as a community. There's a communal obligation. There's a communal obligation. And why is it important is because these children that get put into certain homes, even though the foster carers will try their best because what they will try to do is not impose their religion, their ideas onto that child, but it just so happens naturally. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentions that the example of good company and the example of not so good company is like the example of what? Like the first person, So a person who's a good friend, a good company, good friendship, they're like an, an atar, you know, like a person who sells fragrance. And hamil uh, al-misk, someone who carries musk, i.e. someone who deals with fragrance. But yet a person whose company is not so good, they're like a person who? Nafiq al they're like a, a blacksmith. They blow metal, they melt metal. They're dealing with smoke, fire. And as a result, the clothing becomes smelly, the clothing becomes burnt, it becomes darkened. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, choose your company wisely. Because when you choose good friendship, it will, have, it will brush off on you. Now we're not saying other people are bad. 
What we're saying is from a faith point of view, a faith standpoint, when a Muslim child goes into a non-Muslim house, even the foster child is going to try their best to look after that child. But it's only natural that certain things are maybe creeping into that child, perhaps which are not so Islamic. For example, now, and there have been statistics, people, there are suggestions made by uh, certain organizations that children have led, have become where they've lost their faith. They start becoming rocky in their faith. And also then they start becoming, they feel very uncomfortable because they're the odd one out. To, to, to practice upon their religion in an environment where everyone is non-Muslim, they feel a bit uneasy. And I'll share this with you. How many of us traveling, plane, train, bus, anywhere, time for salah, what do we do? We miss it. I'll pray qada. Like as if it's just something minor. Or I'll, you know, I, they, people will fool themselves in thinking that I will pray at a later time, later time, later time comes, it's not prayed. So we happily miss our salah. Happily. I'm not going to give you my own examples, but obviously, subhanAllah, this is something which as Muslims, so long as we're not causing any inconvenience to anyone, if I'm on the side minding my own business and I'm just doing my fard, I'm not causing no harm to anybody. Okay, and alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, we've been in these predicaments, and it's not like I'm telling you something, but don't do it myself. Trust me, if you travel with me, you'd know. We pull over, we look for a station, if we can pray salah, if there's a proper suitable facility, bismillah. If there isn't, we'll make a facility somewhere, we'll do it. Why? Because this is the taqaza of iman. Because Allah Ta'ala said, when it comes for salah, time for salah, pray salah. You know, pray salah when it comes. So why I'm saying adults, as adults we don't want to, because I'm embarrassed, people are going to think maybe I'm a paki. People maybe think I'm an extremist, they think I'm like this. So the thought comes in the mind, that if I practice on my religion, and the people pray salah, now they're looking around, what are people thinking? Don't worry what people think, worry what Allah thinks. Okay, there's two types of things here. If I put my musalla in the middle of the, in a row, that's wrong, that's zulm now, you're doing wrong. But if I'm on the middle on a side, nowhere, no taklif to anybody, and I'm just doing my thing, alhamdulillah. That's part of adab, adab al muashara. But as adults, we'd find it embarrassing. Because who are, what's, who's watching me? What do people think? We're going in, you know, we wouldn't have that khushu in salah because I'm thinking, what are other people thinking? How about a child then, age of three, five, seven, eight, nine, ten? How are they going to practice on their faith, given in an environment where they are always surrounded by people who don't share the same faith as them? And because obviously now the child, they, for us, if a child comes home and says, I want to have a girlfriend, a boy, we would, we would encourage them and say, look, son, this is not the correct way. When you grow older, inshallah, and you can take marriage and do it the halal way. If a girl came home and said, I want to have a boyfriend, as a, Musli, as, as a Muslim, I'm talking about as a Muslim, Muslim ideals, we would discourage her. We would prohibit her and say, no, I'm sorry. This, this is not the correct way which we believe ought to be practiced upon. But when a child goes in that environment, you can't stop what they do what, and who they see, how they interact. And if a, foster, if a child goes into care and he wants to have a girlfriend, he want, or she wants to have a boyfriend, the foster carer can't really intervene and stop. It has to, they can, you know, so, so long as the child's not breaking the law, and they're not doing anything, they're not instigating anything, they can't really put forward anything on that child. So then it gives a, free, you know, them ch children then slowly, slowly we find them going onto the wrong track according to an Islamic principle. This is an Islamic issue. Thank, may, may Allah reward those people who took those children in their homes. They're doing the best they can according to their means. But what are we doing according to what Allah has given us? This is the question. Because Allah has given us as well as a community, alhamdulillah. There's not only, look, if 4,250 refugee children came in UK, how many Muslims have we got in UK? Within millions. Where are those children then? Why are they going into foster care? Now there's going to be some issues because also now some of them, you know, we, we need to talk about some of these things. What are the barriers? And inshallah we'll touch on that. But I want to mention one thing. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a misunderstanding, and forgive me how I say this, certain cultures are worse than others. Certain cultures. Look, I've got, I've got friends from a vast background. Gambian, Moroccan, Algerian, Pakistani, Bengali, Indian, SubhanAllah, Sri Lankan, very vast different friendship I've had with friends. I have to be honest and say, when it comes to children, that are someone else's, unfortunately, some cultures aren't as good. Aren't as good. In our community, 
and I'll hit the nail on the head, specifically more so the Asian community. If a woman has just been divorced, no children, just divorced, does she find it easy to get married again? She doesn't, does she? Can a woman get married again? No. She struggles to find somebody else. Why? Because there's a taboo on her getting married. In the Arab culture, it's not like that, alhamdulillah. Somali culture, Egypt, Morocco, Jazair, Tunis, it's not like that. Alhamdulillah, it's not like that. It's more so Asian culture. And I'm sorry to, like I said, look, the good things, alhamdulillah, but the negative things we have to highlight and say, look, this is a problem. So we have to work on this, okay? There's a lot of good, but there are some things we need to work on. And this is one of them. But when a woman has children, subhanallah, no one's ready to look after that family. That no one's ready to marry her because they think, why shall I pick up next man's baggage? They're someone else's children, they're not my children. So unfortunately, this culture does exist. And that is why one of the reasons why people, especially from amongst our community, have this sort of cultural barrier. And unfortunately, I don't want to mention specifically, but there are some cultures amongst us that if a woman has marriage from a previous kids, uh, if a woman has children from a previous marriage, she's expected to send them to the father's family and then be separate for her new husband. Do you get it? Some cultures are like this, meaning that the new husband won't have nothing to do with those kids. He refuses outright. Subhanallah, Zayd bin Haritha was the adopted son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You get it? Can you see now? We're, this is what I'm saying. Whenever it's deen, we're far from the ideal. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked after Zayd bin Haritha. He himself was an orphan. He himself was looked after by Halima Saadiyah. He himself was looked after by Halima Saadiya, and she had so much sa'ada and fortune in her home that as soon as she took the Prophet ﷺ in her lap, the animal which she was riding on sped up. When they went home, it was drought. The things started growing. The animals became full with milk. There was barakah. Where did that barakah come from? It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? It's because when we look after the weak in our community, Allah sends down more upon us. Because we are being khairha and good to others, Allah looks at that as an excuse to give us even more. But when we withhold and we say, I'm not spending, then Allah can also withhold as well. So like I said, right, is that these are some of the things which have stopped us accessing those children within those fostering carers, foster carers, those social networks. Why? It's because of the stigma we have of those children. They're someone else's kids. They're somebody else's. They don't belong to my culture. This is nothing to do with Islam. If this was the thinking of Muslims or continues to be that, then there would be never no ukhuwa and brotherhood until the day of Qiyamah. So we have to be the ones that break this trend. As I mentioned, is I'll mention the hadith quickly. The Prophet ﷺ, he said about Yatim, right? He mentions that Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, he mentions firstly, Khayru Bayt, meaning the best of houses, well, the best of homes is that Khayru Bayt in Fil Muslimin. From amongst the Muslims, the best of house is that house, is Fihi Yatim Yuhsanu ilayhi. You want to know the best house from amongst the Muslims? It's not that one that's got a leather sofa or a 15 inch screen TV or two beamers parked outside, or perhaps, for example, not en suite. Extra bathroom, house on three floors. He didn't mention that. Khayru baytun fil muslimin. Khayru baytun fil muslimin. The best house in, of Muslims is that house where there's a yatim, yuhsanu ilayhi, and they're kind towards that child. That's the best house. And you want to know what the most evil house was? Sharru baytun fil muslimin. The worst house, fihi yatim, yusa'u ilayhi. That house wherein there's a yatim and they're horrible and evil to that child. That's the worst house amongst the Muslims. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa said, best house. Looking after your team. Worst house, bad to your team. Another hadith he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned to emphasize, Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu anhu mentions, Ana wa kafir yateen fil jannati hakada. What he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, he said, Me and the person who takes kifala, looks after, protects, stands as, as, as an aid for that child who is a yateen. I and that person will be like this in Jannah, and, he, and he, he, he joined between his two fingers. Meaning, can you see how close that is? We're going to be like this on the day of Qiyat, in Jannah. Subhanallah, these are not just arm normal hadith or just some average words. That means you're going to be in Jannah and have the company of the Prophet ﷺ because you looked after a yateen, because you looked after someone who was poor. One person came to the Prophet ﷺ and he complained and he said that he's got hard heart. Rajulan shaka ila Rasulullah He had the harshness of heart. So the Prophet ﷺ said, simple, imsah ra's al yateen. Imsah ra's al yateen. Just Rub your, head, rub your hand over the head of a yatim, and this will soften your heart. Why? Because you'll take compassion towards that child. This will melt your heart. 
So like I said, we're in a situation where a lot of children in our midst have gone into care. Some may not be because mother and father have passed away or just father have passed away. Maybe some have just been taken out of the care of the mother and father. But irrespective of the circumstance, we have a communal responsibility. Fardi kifaya, I would say, that we have to look after our children on a wider scale. Now, alhamdulillah, it's not all doom and gloom. Asal kafil were those people that would look after a child with no social security, no tax credits, no government aid. Now they're ready to help you financially as well what excuse do we have subhanallah as a community now i know like i said there are still some potential barriers like naturally if you feel that you cannot do make fulfill the, fulfill the hukuk of this child then that's not right that's not right of course we don't want to take a child and then you know knows billah we treat that child badly because as already demonstrated that house where in a treat yadim is treated badly is the worst of all homes let it not be with that however when there is so much available in terms of you know also <clears throat> help and support and then additional to that the religious sort of subhanallah the, the, the fadail and the virtues and the rewards why is it then we don't take advantage of that situation just that slight bit more and as i said in addition to obviously all, everything which i just said is i know i do appreciate that there are maybe some barriers like for example the question arises isn't it that if you have uh, a mother and then she brings up a child what is the issue of hijab and then a, a woman a daughter grows up what is the issue look this is a small juma khutbah but i haven't got time to go in every single nuance and detail but there are ways around okay the, the sharia is not just something that lasts in arabia in saudi arabia it will last until the day of qiyamah our deen is so wholesome and fruitful that it accommodates but it's just we are sometimes too negative sometimes too strict sometimes too vigorous or rigorous that we don't allow and sometimes we don't allow ourselves to go out of a comfort zone, rather, which is something not even religious, it's more something which is perceived religiousness. But like I said, that's another whole scenario. We haven't got time. My, I'm just trying to create some awareness because this is the day a lot of people around the country will be delivering this particular subject. I think it's important as a community we start these discussions because like I said, the biggest value we have, the biggest sarmaya and capital we have, it's not our businesses, it's the children we have. They're, the be, they're gonna be the ones who grow up and be, take the deen further, subhanAllah. However, I'll just say one thing and it's sad and it makes me wanna shed a tear and we can't turn our backs away from this, but the reality is in society, society which we have, those children who don't have the support of mother and father, that's the definition of an orphan within the sort of Western world, but in the sort of Islamic terms as well, it's when a father passes away and only the mother is left looking after that child, we also refer to that child as a yatim. Why? It's because the traditional family setup is the father will be the breadwinner from the home, he will look after and take the kafala and the responsibility for his wife and his children. So when a major breadwinner passes away, now that child is bereft and now becomes a yadim. Now we have, like I said, in this, sadly, I have come across family members call them, people who I know. And what happened is when they don't have had any sort of support, people jacked to their zameen. People it robbed them of their inheritance. People thought no, their father can't come and take it back from us. He can't do nothing now. So they robbed them. Allah Ta'ala mentions sternly for these individuals. Double fold problem. Those individuals who eat the inheritance, eat the, they, they consume the wealth and the money of these yatims. What are they actually doing? They are consuming fire in their stomachs and they will enter a blazing fire of Jahannam. Suddi Rahmatullah Tabi'i, student of Anas ibn Malik and also Abdullah bin Abbas. He said, these individuals raise up on the day of Qiyamah. How will we be able to recognize who are those people that ate the money of the yatim? Those people will be seen how fire will be coming out of their mouths out of their ears and out of their eyes Allahu Akbar Allah will make an example of them in also in they will not have no you will not have no sukoon from that money jack man zameen all you want you will not benefit and this is the what I'll, this is the last thing which I'm finishing on is that ittaqullah fear Allah not just to, for all people who ever think like this that they are a weak link I can just rob them and get away with it 50 years 60 years 100 years then what then what? Because you are going to be eating something, your azab is going to start as soon as you come out of the qabr. As soon as you come out of the qabr, azab is starting. And in the qabr, what am I talking about? You did zulm on people. Out, out on the day of qiyamah, and then in jahannam. This is the word of Allah, not mine. So this is why I say this is a big issue. But this, like I said, that's, alhamdulillah, this so much doesn't happen so much here. But what we can do, those children who are, we can look after, extend, alhamdulillah. 
extend the helping hand. We have Masha, some people that have a four bedroom house, one child. Look after one child. Look at that as a kaf- you're a kafil, a responsible. That alhamdulillah, because of me, this child's iman will be safe. This child will have a good upbringing. Tomorrow, alhamdulillah, his whole nasal will make dua for me. Now, I know there are some Islamic things which we could talk about. We don't adopt them like that. I won't say to them that you're, you're my son and deny them any hukuk with their family. That doesn't work that. That's, that's basically, there's an element which people used to do in the time of jahiliyyah. They would take a child, like the prophet Zayd ibn Haritha was referred to as Zayd ibn Muhammad. And then this verse came down that don't call them by the names of, or, 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 call them by the names of their fathers. This is more just. So then everyone started calling Zayd bin Haritha. His real name Zayd bin Haritha, not Zayd bin Muhammad. Why? Because people thought, well, he's like the son of Muhammad sallallahu So you don't take that child as your own, but you treat him like your own. And you don't deny him of his <laughs> link with his parents and to say that you're, you have a father, you have a family. I'm here because I love you, and this is my Islamic responsibility, and I'm here for you. Subhanallah, that's what you call ukhuwa. That's what you call ikhwa, a real Muslim brothers, Allahu Akbar. It's not just praying salah, mashallah, bids down to you here, mashallah, Allah khair salah. This is deen. Yes, yeah, a part of deen, but what about the mu'ashra, the ukhuwa? These things, wallahi qasam, these things are really important. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq to make amal and practice inshallah. Like I said, this is to create some awareness. Although it's a very big topic. May Allah guide us, inspire us, give us the ability to make amal and practice. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.